I am Judith Kelly, Dean of the Sanford School of Public Policy. And I'm so thrilled to invite you to the first of our events in our Stand For, uh, Stand For series. This is a series we're doing this fall to honor our founder, Terry Sanford. Terry Sanford said, I've said to students, if you get into politics, you ought to get in with the frame of mind that winning is not everything. And if standing for something defeats you, so be it, stand for something. And so this fall, uh, the Sanford School is putting on a series of events, stand for equity, stand for democracy, and so forth. And today, we're so happy that you're joining us for the first one, which is stand for justice. A special thanks to the Keenan uh, Charitable Trust Endowment Fund, which is supporting this series in honor of our uh, uh, founder, Terry Sanford. The mission of the Sanford School is to improve lives through teaching, uh, research, and service and engagement. And so this series uh, falls right down uh, the, the line of what our mission is. And I am so excited to welcome our esteemed panelists. And I will uh, especially welcome our moderator today, uh, Professor Brandon Garrett. Brandon Garrett joined the Duke Law Faculty in 2018 as the inaugural L. Neil Williams Jr. Professor of Law. And he's a leading scholar in criminal justice outcomes, evidence, and constitutional rights. And he's also director of the Wilson Center for Science and Justice at the uh, law school. So welcome to everybody. I hope that as you uh, view the discussion today, that you will think about what you stand for. Over to you, Garrett. Brandon. Great. Thank you so much, Dean Kelly. And thank you to everyone, particularly those of you at Sanford who made this event possible. Um, Today is the first day that our center has been called the Wilson Center for Science and Justice. We had our launching event earlier, earlier today, and today has been a celebration of the challenges and the rewards of doing tough work to try to turn around our criminal legal system. Um, so hoping our presenters, uh, starting with you, Cassandra, and then Alec, and then Bianca, could each talk for a few minutes about your work how you came into this work, especially for our students that are still thinking about their careers and wondering what to do next. If you don't mind giving a little bit of your, your early story, I, I think that especially the students in the audience would really appreciate that. Um, and, uh, uh, and, and of course, describe what you're doing now. Uh, and, then, and then we'll come back to each of you several times and hopefully you'll also pose questions to each other and we'll get great questions from the audience. And please in the audience, uh, submit questions in the chat. We're really looking forward to to your, your thoughts and your inquiries as well. So thank you again, Cassandra, over to you. Thanks. So hi everyone, my name is Cassandra Frederic. I am the Executive Director at Drug Policy Alliance. We are a national organization that works to create alternative policy responses to drug use and drug possession. Um, and so what that means is that we wanna end the war on drugs. Uh, we work on things, popular things like legalizing cannabis, and we also work on increasing access to health services for people who struggle with addiction. Um, we're working on um, also removing criminal penalties for drug-related issues. And so we have been, we've been around for 20 years. This is actually the summer we celebrated our 20th anniversary. Um, and we do work at the state level, city level, as, as well as the federal level. Um, what's really exciting about it and really important is that we look at drug policy not just as a domestic issue, but an international one as well. So much of what we've done around drug policy has been exported to countries um, around the world. Um, and in some ways that have been beneficial, like introducing harm reduction um, in different parts of the world, like in Brazil, to the draconian ways that we look at punishment and deal with people who use drugs as what we see in the Philippines um, and in parts of Asia where there's a lot of extrajudicial killings for people who possess drugs. Um, we fund a lot of draconian policies around drugs as well as what we see in Latin and Central America um, with militarized policing. A lot of the things that we see in the US, whether it is the ways that our policing systems have been um, um, militarized with tanks um, and tear gas, a lot of that can be funded 
through the drug war. And oftentimes it's funded through the drug war and the war on terror. And so there are so many different avenues that we do this work in, um, and we've been involved in most of it. Uh, I want to be really clear to the students that you don't actually have to know what you wanna do by the time you graduate. Sometimes people fall into the work um, based on where they're from or what they think about. So for me, I actually just started as the executive director two weeks ago. Um, and on uh, September 25th, it will be the 11th anniversary of when I started at DPA as an intern. So I started off at DPA as an intern. Um, I was in grad school in the social work school. And in social work programs, you do classes and you also have a field placement. My first year field placement was in a middle school in the South Bronx. And my uh, second year placement was supposed to be at another criminal justice organization doing court mitigation. Um, but that fell through when the internship supervisor at the placement and the internship supervisor at my grad school got into an argument. And therefore I couldn't <laughs> do the internship because the internship supervisor at my grad school was like, fine, I don't like you either. And my students not coming. And I was like, no, that was my top choice. And so then, <laughs> oh man, yeah. So then I went to DPA. I had no idea what drug policy was about. In fact, I was like, oh, perfect. I'm at Drug Policy Alliance. I'm going to fill out an application to work for the federal government to work with them on drug policy. And everyone at Drug Policy Alliance laughed because they were like, no, no, we're on the opposite side of them. And then I was just like, wait, what? So then I thought I wasn't going to have a job. But then I just stayed at DPA and I learned tons of things. Um, and so part of the reason I say that is because I think it's really important for people to not to be committed to what you think your life is supposed to look like because sometimes policy work you'll find different ways for you to engage and as someone who grew up in Giuliani New York it has been the pleasure of my life deconstructing the policies that he built my childhood around and so things like um the marijuana arrest that he like elevated um, as a part of Broken Windows Policing, the work that I've done has dropped marijuana arrests in New York by 98% in the last 10 years. Today, we um, are putting forward expungement for the first time in, in New York State. Um, the kinds of supports that we have for harm reduction are world class. These are all things Giuliani fought against. And so it's really exciting to be in this moment, um, taking one of the most draconian executives um, that has run New York City and taking his policies apart bit by bit. And so I'll stop there. It's so wonderful to be with my friends, Cassandra and Bianca. And thank you, Brandon, uh, for inviting us and, and giving us the space to talk about our work. Uh, and also to you, Judith, for, for hosting this event at, at the Sanford Center. My entry into this work um, started uh, as a public defender in Alabama, and I worked every single day representing uh, human beings who were too poor to afford a lawyer who were charged with federal crimes. And uh, doing that work, I saw things that really shook me to the core. Uh, I saw a criminal punishment bureaucracy that was utterly uninterested in the values and and lofty principles that it that it has on its marble monuments and written in its constitutional scrolls, and instead a, a an architecture of oppression, and one that was designed to uh, inflict a tremendous amount of pain and brutality on the bodies and minds and families of the most marginalized people in our society. Um, I left my job um, as a public defender um, in late 2013 and got a grant to start um, doing the work that I'm doing today. And uh, I had been living as a public defender in Washington, D.C., and the first thing I did uh, when I got the grant and quit my job was I, I flew back to Alabama and I just drove around from court to court, from jail to jail, uh, just interviewing people and their families. And the things that I saw on that first trip really changed the course of my career after that. Um, I got to Montgomery, Alabama, where I used to live, and, and I walked into the court and there were 67 human beings, all of them were black, uh, in jail garb and chains. Uh, 
as I watched court, uh, I saw that not one of them was accused of a crime. They were all there in cages because they owed money to the city for old traffic tickets. And I went up into the jail and I interviewed people one after another and the stories were heartbreaking. The first person I interviewed had been sitting on her couch with her one-year-old on her lap and her four-year-old next to her and the police raided her home, took her away from her kids. She hadn't seen them in weeks. She had no idea where they are. Um, and, and then they told her that she could either pay them $2,807 or sit in jail um, until all of her debts were extinguished at a rate of $50 a day or if she agreed to be a janitor to clean the feces and the blood and the mucus and the mold from the jail floors and walls and beds uh, that she could get $75 a day and get back to find her children more quickly. And this is the thing that as I've gone around the country in the years since, um, the thing that, that is the most striking to me is that um, in 3,163 local jails around this country, we have allowed them to become grotesque torture chambers. Not only are people are deprived of um, clean air and water and exercise, and, uh, but even the most basic things that we all take for granted about life, like hugging one's child or going on a date or going to the theater, um, or just very basic things like protecting one's body from sexual and physical assault, from contracting infectious disease, all of which occur at astronomical rates in our cages. And so uh, we, we brought that first case in Montgomery, brought a civil rights um, lawsuit in federal court, and within weeks, um, the city released everybody from its jail rather than defend our lawsuit. Um, and then after that, I went to, to Ferguson when Michael Brown was murdered in 2014. And we built a very similar kind of case when I got to Ferguson uh, and started embedding myself with the people that were in the streets and in their homes and in the jails and learned that that um, Ferguson averaged 3.6 arrest warrants per household, almost all of which for unpaid debt, almost every single one uh, for a black person. And as I've gone around the country over and over again, in state after state after state, and city after city after city, the same patterns reproduce themselves. And I, and I started to think much more deeply and much more critically, um, is the system just broken as a lot of um, criminal justice reformers? Those are terms I don't use. Um, I don't want anyone to get the sense that, that the system is either intending or accomplishing anything close to, to how I think of the word justice. But I started to think, is it just that all of these people are, are dumb? Like, like Cassandra mentioned the drug war, we've invested trillions of dollars. We've destroyed the rainforest in multiple countries. We have um, surveilled and searched and seized um, tens of trillions of global communications every single year. Um, we have caged uh, tens of millions of people. We have separated hundreds of millions of people from their families. Um, we have sentenced people to hundreds of millions of years in prison uh, at enormous social costs. We've changed the way we all interact with each other by, by changing the way we conceive of privacy. We have allowed tens of millions of strip searches and stops, and you get the point, tasers, guns, cages. Um, all of this supposedly for this drug war. And yet um, the usage rates for drugs are higher in many demographics than they were before the drug war began. Is it just that all of the human beings involved in the, 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 what's called the war on drugs are dumb? That if we went to them with some evidence, like, like uh, what the Wilson Center does, you know, scientifically studying it and said, did you know that all of this effort is not only horrible for people, particularly black people and poor people, but it actually also isn't effective that if we just did that, the people in charge of it would just tomorrow say, oh my goodness, I had no idea. Let's change the whole system. Well, the work that we do at Civil Rights Corps is premised on the idea that that is wrong. The system is not in fact broken. The system is working exactly as it's intended. Uh, the goal of the system isn't um, holistic well-being and human flourishing, but the goal is control and surveillance and brutality to keep certain people in our population in a position that benefits certain other people in our population. The goal is to preserve the wealth and property of the elite people who control our society. And so our organization works all over the country with uh, advocates and organizers and activists and directly impacted people and amazing, brilliant people like Bianca and Cassandra um, uh, to ask different questions about why we have the criminal punishment bureaucracy, to work with artists and musicians and journalists and organizers and, and other attorneys, um, to be part of a broader social movement that changes fundamentally the way we think about human caging because a few little tweaks here and there to policies aren't gonna get us out of this horrific nightmare. What we need is a much more uh, structural approach to building power um, to, to, to change the way that, that 
powerful interests in our society have used the criminal punishment bureaucracy to inflict so much pain. So I'm really looking forward to talking a little bit about that in more detail with, with everyone tonight. Thanks, Alec um, and Cassandra. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Bianca Tylek. I'm really excited to be here. Thank you, Brandon. Thank you, Judith. Um, and also always love uh, seeing some of my favorites in the field, Alec and Cassandra, so thank you. Um, I, uh, Bianca, I am the executive director at Worth Rises, an organization uh, dedicated to dismantling the prison industry and um, ending the exploitation of people who are incarcerated and their loved ones, um, namely and specifically black and brown and indigenous people. And we uh, work explicitly looking at the criminal legal system and how it is used as a vehicle for extraction of wealth from uh, directly impacted communities. And that being one of the driving forces of mass incarceration and mass surveillance. Uh, we really look and try to build a community um, in which in a society in which no entity or individual um, depends on human caging or control, that means mass inc incarceration or surveillance um, for their wealth, operation, or livelihood. That means whether you're a CEO of a private prison company making $6 million a year, or you're a correctional officer making $30,000 a year, we wanna shut down the industry and shift the economy away from the caging and control of human beings. Uh, and so we do that in a, in a variety of ways, um, but namely through shifting the public narrative and really exposing the prison industry. Um, and you know, I, I wanna clarify that when we talk about the prison industry, we are not just talking about privatization. Again, we are talking about all of the financial actors who have an interest in this system and who utilize the system as a vehicle for extraction. And so that includes the private sector, but it also includes government. Um, Alec, you know, was mentioning uh, fines and fees, right? So things of that sort. It also includes labor. Um, so a lot of a labor institutes, uh, particularly correctional officer labor, police union labor, um, that strives to uphold and maintain the system. Um, and finally, it also in some cases, uh, Includes some really unethical nonprofits. Um, it's often surprising for people to hear that, in fact, prison labor um, in many states is run by nonprofit institutions um, that were created by the state. And so we think of all of those actors as part of the prison industry. The prison industry is an $80 billion um, space and more than $80 billion, that figure is even a few years old now. And it's divided really into 12 uh, unique sectors from uh, food and commissary to healthcare to telecom. Um, all of those different features have been commodified um, and corporatized in, in our uh, prison system. And we are often working to try to unpack what those mean. And so what we're probably best known for now in our work um, is our work on prison phone justice. Um, on the campaign side of things. And so that is uh, our work to combat the $1.2 billion prison telecom industry that charges families as much as $25 for a simple 15 minute phone call to be in touch with a loved one who's incarcerated. Um, it means one in 28 children who face, face the parental incarceration um, are often subject to that cost basis as one that interrupts and disrupts their relationships with their parents. Um, in fact, one in three families goes into debt trying to stay in touch. And so that particular piece um, is one that we're really trying to unpack. And we've been doing that from a lot of different directions. We usually combine one of the things that we found to be effective in, in our campaigning is combining corporate campaigns with policy campaigns to toxify an industry, um, threaten uh, sort of capital um, it, through investors and all of that, and at the same time, um, break down the policy that allows for these industries to flourish. And so by doing that, we've lost um, the prison telecom industry more than a billion dollars in the last year. Uh, and in a few particular uh, states and jurisdictions been able to move um, first in the nation legislation uh, that made phone calls entirely free for those populations. And so that we've 
passed our first bill, making phone calls free in New York City in 2018, um, which made, which saved directly impacted communities roughly $10 million a year and opened line of, lines of communications for those who couldn't afford it in the first place. In fact, 38% um, increase in phone uh, call volume overnight. Uh, and then a year later, we're able to do the same thing in San Francisco. And now we have um, statewide bills in Connecticut, New York, Massachusetts, um, and bills on the federal level. So we also do work there. Um, and then on the other side of our work, uh, in the public education realm where we are talking about exposing these companies and often or these different financial actors um, and how they build their wealth. Uh, we have a report that we publish annually that exposes over 4,000 corporations involved in the prison industry. I got into this space and one of the reasons why um, I sort of do specifically the piece of this puzzle that uh, we do at Worth Rises um, is I actually came from finance. I came from the corporate world. I um, spent four years working at your big banks um, in uh, on Wall Street and uh, and spent that time before heading back um, to school uh, and uh, you know, pursuing um, a law degree and coming out and starting uh, Worth Rises to really sort of pair a number of these different types of skill sets um, from sort of policy and the legal aspect, but also this financial lens um, and understanding where the vulnerabilities of both public and private corporations exist and how to undermine revenue models um, built around the exploitation of marginalized communities. Um, so that's sort of my background. That's um, our spiel and I'll sort of stop there. Thank you, Eid, so much. And I see we have more than 80 participants. So come on, send your questions in. We have just one question so far in the Q&A, but hopefully we'll have 82 more. Uh, and uh, one question was, which I was hoping you could each talk to, uh, and I think you could each speak to it in really, really interesting ways for our listeners and viewers, is to talk about how you view your work and your organization's work in connection with community activists, especially, you know, things have changed over the summer, given the scale of racial justice protests across the country. How do you view your work in relationship with those movements? Obviously, it's different if you're doing a policy report or digging into the finances of the prison phone industry or bringing a lawsuit. Um, and yet, you each talked about some ways that you are deeply connected with the activist community. I, I would love for each of you to describe your, how you view your role in connection with activists. You go in the same order or go in reverse order? Do you want to start, Sandra? You know, I actually had a conversation with some folks um, last week where I talked about how I think that in order for us to make sustainable change, um, the work that we have to do on the ground um, is to change hearts and minds and change the way that people think about um, issues. And that policy is actually about codifying that change. Um, because I often feel like people think that we have to start with policy and changing policy is what is going to change people's hearts and minds. And there are so many policy examples of how that's not true and how policy is so malleable based on the changing tides in the wind. And if the on the ground conversation is not happening within communities, um, then it's not sustainable wins. And it's one that you'll consistently have to fight um, to defend. And so I often think that good policy can't happen without, um, converse, without it being driven by the people who need um, their hearts and minds changed. I often find that, that if we have to create laws in order for people to be respected, we've, we've already, we're already fighting a losing battle. Um, and so I find that our work with um, communities is integral to the way that we build um, accountable and policy campaigns with integrity. Um, and that's a lot of our work has been done with people who actually use drugs um, and those who um, enjoy drugs or who have a really hard time with drugs um, and figure out what are the policies or infrastructure or resources that are necessary for people to live lives that are not criminalized or stigmatized. That's such an important question. I think it's, important first to start with a political analysis 
you have to understand why and how the world looks the way that it looks. I apologize. I just started cat sitting for these two kittens and they keep trying to jump in front of me. Especially when I start talking about capitalism, they sense it. I was about to mention capitalism. Um, I think it's really important to understand, have, have to have a theory for why the world looks the way that it looks. So um, why uh, uh, do Western countries engage in militarized imperialism, right? Why does the punishment bureaucracy look the way that it does in this country? Why did the prison and jail population multiply by a factor of five from 1980 until 2020? Why does the United States cage black people at a rate six times that of South Africa at the height of apartheid? The answers to those questions don't have anything to do with um, us not understanding good policy. Like Cassandra was saying, and I think hinting at like, um, this system is about power and it's about politics and it's not about policy. So we're not, we're not struggling for the policy answer in much of the criminal punishment bureaucracy context. We know um, how to reduce prison and jail populations. We know how to create a system that doesn't extract wealth from people and exploit them and cage them and brutalize them. Most of the world does it. This country did it for the first 200 years of its existence. Um, but what, what we have to think about is um, these problems are really one of power. Um, and so um, how do you build power? Well, I don't think it's coming up with the best legal argument in litigation or the best policy argument for, for legislators. Um, I think it has to do with how do you organize people? And how do you organize them to build relationships and power that the people who control our society must listen to? And, and I think, and at least as a litigator, um, because most of the work that I've done uh, over the last few years has been using litigation to challenge the money bail system, to challenge debtors prison systems, to challenge the you know, taking away people's driver's licenses because they can't pay, to sue prosecutors, to sue police. So it might be kind of strange coming from me that I actually don't think litigation is really the, the, the way to, to build power. But what I, what, I, what I think is important to understand is that the courts in this country um, have never been uh, an agent of social change. They've never been at the, at, the, at the vanguard of social justice. Courts are political institutions that respond to political realities. So for example, um, some very smart lawyers brought challenges to um, same-sex marriage prohibitions and um, other similar um, discriminatory laws in the early 1980s. And they lost in virtually every court they brought them. And they lost in the US Supreme Court. A couple of decades later, some of the same lawyers and some very smart other lawyers brought similar challenges to same-sex marriage bans. And this time they won using the same six or seven words in the 14th Amendment. Now, what happened? Did their legal arguments become better? Did lawyers become better at making arguments in court? Um, did the Supreme Court suddenly become an institution of social justice? No, what happened was there was a social movement in between that changed the way we all think about same-sex marriage and changed the, the calculus of people in power in our society, but who they could exploit and how. And so a similar uh, corollary is Brown versus Board of Education, probably the most famous Supreme Court case in modern American history. Um, uh, but you can, you can issue a legal ruling like that. Um, and then that says, you know, um, segregation in schools is unconstitutional, but then 10, 20, 30, 40, 60 years after Brown, you can have segregated schools to an even a greater extent in much of the country than prior to Brown if you don't address the underlying structural inequalities, white supremacy and capitalism, and, and, and the control of our society and people who own things. Um, these systems are going to keep reproducing themselves. So in our work, um, we're constantly thinking not about winning a legal case or a legal argument. We're thinking about who are the organizers and activists and, and ordinary people on the ground hopefully and typically led by people who have directly experienced the harms of these systems and asking how can the, the legal skills that we have fit into a, a movement that they're building? Um, because unless they build that movement and change the balance of power, the same systems that we're fighting against, we might even win a legal victory, but the same system will morph into a new mechanism of oppression with a different label. We can get rid of something like cash bail, but the punishment bureaucrats who control the criminal punishment system are gonna replace cash bail with pretrial detention. And the same people are gonna be kept in jail for a different, with a different label and a different supposed reason. Unless you build power that says, we demand that you liberate and release our people from jail. So that's how we sort of think about our very, very limited role as lawyers. 
Yeah, all of too. I mean, I think all of all of the points that Cassandra and, and Alec raised are super important. For us at Worth Rises, we actually just we think about one really um, in, phrase in particular, which is that we don't carry the burden, we don't make the decision. And that for us is a guiding principle, a guiding light that um, you know we are consistently thinking about when we move our campaigns, which means um, in order for us to make really critical decisions about our campaigns, we have to have people in the room who are those that are going to carry the burden of those decisions. Um, and so all of our campaigns um, are uh, inclusive of um, directly impacted people, not just as as um, spokespeople and folks on the front, but folks who are making decisions um, within that campaign and that being really critical. Um, we, our team is made up of, of um, some directly impacted people and we are consistently working with uh, directly impacted people. Uh, and for us, you know, I think we try to go even further than just saying people who have experienced the harm in the system, um, but people who are continuing to experience the harm in the system. So we work with a lot of people who are currently still incarcerated um, and um, working to elevate those voices and make sure that people on the outside are still hearing them. And that has looked like a lot of different things. Um, that looks like regular, like, phone calls every day. That looks like when we are um, building out sites, um, somebody who's been in prison for 20 years who may have not seen the internet, but is designing the header for the website um, and, um, and sending that to us by mail, um, quite literally, and, and commissioning artwork from people um, and working um, to create audio clips of people's voices to be part of campaigns. Um, some of our partners have used those even in uh, meetings with legislators recordings of people inside um, telling legislators what they think of particular policies and how they think policies should change. Um, so really finding creative ways to lift up voices of those from our community, um, also those who are still um, in many ways blocked from uh, participation in democratic um, society. Uh, we also, uh, we are a national organization, but most of our work is actually done at the state and local level. Um, and so we very often are building uh, bridges and relationships with local organizers in every state and every jurisdiction that we go first and foremost. Um, we are invited in um, uh, by many um, and always when we come into spaces to uh, move and ensure that what we're asking for uh, and what we're pushing for reflects the values of each of those communities where we are supporting uh, campaigns. Great, those are really, really interesting, complex and provoking answers. And I had some other questions, but we're starting to get some great questions from, from viewers. And I'd love to, to share some of those with you. Uh, you may not all want to answer every one of them, which is fine. We've been going one, two, three, one, two, three. We don't need to do that. Um, but the first question is one which I'm guessing you all three will have something to say. Um, so uh, in the audience, we have a question for the whole panel. Uh, do you believe in prison abolition? And if so, how do we start moving towards that vision? Any thoughts on, on where to begin? I'll start. <laughs> um, we, we've all debated this topic and discussed this in grave detail and great detail. So, um, absolutely, I will say, you know, for Worth Rises as an organization, we are a um, openly prison and police abolition organization. Um, we believe strongly in the dismantling of our system and our uh, facilities and the tearing down of walls. Um, I saw some questions, I think there was like a blended question around abolition and defund police. So I think it probably behooves us to um, bring those together as we're talking. Um, and so for us, you know, we uh, have a very strong feeling that tearing down the financial interests of the system um, will in large part help us um, pave the road and clear the road for the policies that allow us to get to, uh, to the abolition of the system. And I always um, like to say that abolition is not just demolition. Um, it is, in fact, the building of things in um, in the place. Um, and so, abolition is, in large part, thinking about what is the society we want to actually build. What does that society have? Because 
Because if you're asking and there will be somebody here who's thinking, well, what do we do when somebody commits a crime? That question's too late in the infrastructure. Um, that question is asking, you know, what's, what do we do as a reaction rather than what do we do as prevention? Um, and so thinking about how do we build a world where um, we, uh, excise all of the factors that lead people to make decisions um, that would be um, considered criminal. And we can also get into a question about whether all things that are criminal um, and what what things are criminal and how that's decided by white wealth, but that's um, sort of a separate question. Um, but on this, you know, I think really think Thinking about how we institute the healthcare, the education, the housing, um, all of those social structures for those who need them, the treatment services um, for either substance abuse or um, or mental health uh, concerns and things like that. How do we actually create the social structures that allow us to um, prevent people from uh, necessary decisions around crime? Um, and rather than as one particularly pointed, um, uh, currently incarcerated activist um, recently said, stop asking, you know, what's wrong with somebody um, when they commit a crime and start asking what happened to this person. Um, and, and sort of unpacking that and that being the road to abolition um, in many ways and understanding that intersectionality between um, uh, prisons and policing, right? And, and so for us as an organization, we also are supporting many of the defund police uh, calls to action. And one of the things that we're in particular contributing to that conversation is an understanding of exactly how police are funded. Um, as uh, the conversation around defund police really emerged, um, the first things that everybody jumped to were legislative budgets. And while really critical, and in many uh, cases, the largest piece of uh, police department funding, it is not the only, and in some cases, like by far not the only. Uh, so there are also fines and fees help fund police, civil asset forfeiture, super tied to the war on drugs fund police, um, service contracts fund police, uh, police foundations, or in other words, corporate uh, donations fund police. And so there's all these other sources of funding. And if we really truly want to defund police um, and abolish police and prisons, um, then we need to be looking at all those different sources that are coming together and asking ourselves, why are corporations funding police? Um, getting back to you know Alex's point earlier, which is that police are police were you know created to protect property in this country in particular, um, specifically property in the form of black bodies at some point, um, and re um, and thinking about what that means today uh, and what are police continuing to uh, to protect and in large part um, corporate form and and I just to leave with one last example. Um, I always ask people like when you uh, when you lose your phone and you need to um, ask your insurance to replace your phone, what's the first thing they ask you for, right? A police report because I need to go tell some other person with a badge to validate what I just told them to a company that I pay every month um, just because and, and not because being because the corporation thinks that I should be scared of lying to the police and what that very clearly illustrates is the notion that policing is meant to terrorize and instill fear in people um, and that that is not what keeps any of us safe uh, and so you know for us I think we can say very very clearly that um, where we stand on that question um, and what we want to see. I'll go next, I guess. Um, I have lots of thoughts about this. Uh, I've written quite a bit about this. So I'll try to, I'll try to keep it brief. Um, I, I think before we even have a discussion about abolition, we can all agree that the vast bulk of the criminal punishment system that exists now today in this country is completely absurd. Um, before we even get to difficult questions like how do you um, deal with a situation where someone has caused real harm to someone else. Um, that's not what most of what's going on in the criminal punishment system. So 96% um, of all police activity is for non, what police themselves call non-criminal uh, and non-violent um, behavior. Uh, only 4% of what police themselves, I mean, again, I'm using the words of police themselves. Um, 
is only 4% of what they do is dealing with violent crime, so-called violent crime. I think that the notion of what is violent and what isn't violent is heavily socially constructed by people who have power. They want you to think certain things are violent, but certain forms of, of deep structural violence that, that kill way more people and, and, and harm way more people aren't violent at all. Um, so they want you to think that the you know, deliberate poisoning of children's water is not violent, right? Um, the poisoning of our air is not violent. Um, the the, the um, sexual assault in jails don't count in violent crime statistics. I could go on and on. But um, so if, if only 4% of what the criminal punishment bureaucracy is doing is, is this sort of violent crime that it holds up as its entire basis for existing, um, then I think we can all agree that, uh, that, that much of it can be, can be um, deconstructed and this bureaucracy can be dismantled um, without even getting to this, um, I think, fundamentally difficult question, which really troubles a lot of people. What, what would we do without police and prison? What would we do with, with the really bad people, right? That's the, a question I get a lot, right? Um, in addition to what Bianca said about like, sort of problematizing this, 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 this idea that there are bad people, um, I think what's really interesting to think about um, is uh, when, when someone says to me, I can't understand how you're an abolitionist, I just don't understand what we do with the people who are, who are really dangerous. I, I think those people are, trying, are imagining a world that looks exactly like our current world with just all the police and prisons gone. Um, that's not the world that abolitionists are envisioning. Abolitionists are dreaming of a different world that is so fundamentally different in terms of the trauma and despair and alienation that people are subjected to and the poverty um, that, 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 that creates so much desperation and need and conflict, um, the toxic masculinity that is, that is rampant in our society and correlated with so much violence in our society. These, these are things that abolitionists um, are, are working to eliminate from the world. Um, one of the most amazing uh, abolitionist programs that I've ever come across is a program called Success Stories, which was which started by a, a person that I think we all know um, named Richie Edmund Vargas. And, um, and, and Richie's, when he was in prison in, in California, he, he organized uh, for years and created a, a community um, that, that studied together radical feminist literature. And the idea behind it was that um, most of the violence in our society is the result of toxic masculinity. And what would happen if we really delved deep and, and eradicated that from our from our lives. And then the people that go through that program the first year, then facilitate it the following year when they get out of prison now that now that Richie is out, he hires them and they go into other facilities and in, in, in non-prison environments as well. And it's incredible. Um, the, the results that they get, this is this is an abolitionist intervention. This is something that's intervening in what's thought to be the the, the core reason that our entire system of police and prisons exists is about violent crime um, in a way that doesn't involve um, caging people away from their families. It doesn't involve brutalizing people. That doesn't involve putting people in solitary confinement. There are 300,000 human beings right now as we have this conversation in solitary confinement in this country, in a locked box with no natural light and no books and no human contact. Um, that breaks people, that changes people, that creates trauma and despair that then leads to cycles of, of, of what people call violent crime. So I was recently debating uh, the Houston police chief on, on the radio um, and he started screaming at me that I was a, you know, abolitionist, like uh, Antifa kind of guy, you know, the, the sort of Trump talking points. Um, and, and he said, uh, we need uh, our police because we right now live in the most violent society in the history of the world. And so I said to him, um, well, the Houston Police Department budget is $960 million a year and the sheriff's office budget in the same town is $560 million a year. And there are 60 other police officers police uh, um, departments just in Harris County, Texas alone. Um, and those, you're spending tens of billions of dollars a year on the incarceration complex in Harris County, and you still have the most violent, dangerous society in the history of the world? Well, shouldn't that tell you that something about what you're doing isn't working? And that we might want to try something else to, to address what we all have a, a need for, and that is safety and well-being. We all want to live flourishing lives with our families. Nobody wants to be um, harmed and nobody wants people to, to be subjected to physical assault. Um, but the question is, how do you create a society where people have the connections to each other and their material needs are being met so that they don't engage in behavior that's harmful? And that when they do engage in that behavior, we don't re-harm them by throwing them in a cage where they're likely to be assaulted and, and, and brutalized again, but we hold them accountable in a way that actually is meaningful for the people that they've harmed. And that's, I see a question in the box about restorative justice, and perhaps we can have time to talk about 
what that might mean a little bit later. But I've already been rambling too much because once you ask about abolition, I can go on for days. So I'll just stop there and let Cassandra uh, address it next. So I want to make sure that we get to the other questions in the box. So I will say I, Cassandra Frederick, am an abolitionist in prison and police. I will say that Drug Policy Alliance's uh, trademarks uh, statement is no more drug war. Um, and that is specifically no more drug war, not just a little bit drug war. So our purpose is to abolish the drug war in all its forms and facets. So through criminalization, through surveillance, through punishment. Um, and I think when we have the larger conversation, for us, you know, I take into um, great um, space what my notorious RWG, Ruth um, Wilson Gilmore says, which is that it's less about figuring out if we are abolitionists and more about like, is your work trying to abolish the conditions that make the, the carceral state possible? Um, and that is squarely what drug policy does. It's like, how do we abolish the conditions that, that make substance use a, a, a platform and a feeder into mass criminalization, surveillance and punishment? And so, that is a lot of the work that we do. And I think for us, that is a great frame because we recognize that carceral policies are not just in jails and prisons, but are also in our care systems. So the ways that treatment facilities are set up, the way that schools are set up, the way that hospitals are set up, the way that jobs are set up, that people that use drugs are often dealing with carceral structures. And there's a praxis that is put um, that is used to, that is employed to navigate people who use drugs. Um, and we want to abolish all those conditions. Um, and so that is in the way that we frame our work. I would love if, if some of you have thoughts on this question that we received on communication, social media, performing arts. What is the role of communication and art in affecting how people conceive of some of these problems or? how people can envision a different society. Yeah, I'm happy to weigh in on this one. Um, uh, also an artist and so also an oil painter and, and do a bit of this myself, but we also do it within the organization. And I was kind of starting to touch on this earlier that we commission pieces from people inside. Um, but we actually uh, really believe in the power, the transformative power of arts to have a conversation with the public that's very different from the kind of conversation we can have. Um, <laughs> Um, that we can have as a as policy advocates, as attorneys, as organizers. Sometimes, you know, our um, rhetoric will not land, will not um, really um, pierce that um, that wall that people have up, um, the boundaries that people have up. But art has such a different um, capability of doing that, and so we really. Um, leaned into this um, originally um, when um, back uh, in 2018, we had uh, a art exhibit um, where we collected pieces, um, uh, actually put a call to artists out who are in prison um, and specifically on our mission, on the, the concept of the commodification of people who are in prison and their families. And the exhibit was called Capitalizing on Justice. And, you know, we sort of lofted some ideas um, there and invited artists in prison to submit uh, pieces and we you know got pieces from all over the country um, and ended up curating an exhibit with formerly incarcerated artists who were out um, and a really beautiful curator Nicole Fleetwood who has um, a exhibition right now at, um, at the moment PS1 Museum in New York um, but and studies the impact of art on people who are incarcerated and put together this really beautiful um, exhibit where people took this idea of capitalizing on justice in really um, remarkable directions that we um, may have not um, conceived of before. Um, and so, you know, there was uh, 
thought pieces about um, pharmaceuticals and pharmaceutical drugs and how they move and how pharmaceutical companies really specifically target uh, prisons and jails because they know that that's where their base is. Um, that's where their customer or their consumer base is. And in fact, Alchemy's the um, producer of Vivitrol, um, yeah, because I don't know, the producer of Vivitrol, which is, you know, quote unquote, one of the opioid um, treatments uh, and also one of the biggest uh, producers of anti-psychotic um, drugs um, is one of the uh, sponsors of the American Correctional Association's conference every year, right? So they have like a really clean understanding of exactly where their consumer base is. And so one person um, who was uh, in a mental health uh, ward in a facility did an entire piece about being like drowned by pharmaceuticals. Um, so there, you know, we ended up seeing all these really remarkably uh, beautiful pieces and putting together this exhibition that was far more successful than we ever imagined. And largely because people in really different spaces, people in the art world started getting involved. People really started to see something in it who had never really um, considered uh, justice work, criminal justice work as part of their um, you know, daily sort of routine or, or their knowledge base. And so we think that it can be really remarkably powerful. Um, and, uh, and right now are in fact, um, have gotten to a place where we are uh, also challenging museums. So it's not just the notion of how can art be used as a tool to, for change, but also um, how have art museums um, actually washed philanthropy that's dirty in this space? Um, and how can we use museums um, as weapons against prison profit profiteers? Um, and so we just launched a campaign actually last week uh, targeting uh, the LACMA board, the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, um, and demanding that Tom Gores, um, a huge profiteer, uh, prison profiteer, uh, who owns the largest, most predatory prison telecom company in the country, um, sits on that board and demanding that he be removed from that board. Um, and that was covered not just in the LA Times and LA Magazine, but in the art newspaper and women's wear daily and hyperallergic outlets that really cover predominantly art. So there's a, there's a lot of ways that the art community um, and not just visual arts, but performing arts as well um, can uh, intersect with this work in remarkably powerful ways to both join the fight, um, but also to convey um, the what we're you know what we really want people to understand. Great. Um, so we have several questions around restorative just, justice, and Alec kind of left off with it, and maybe we could come back to 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 that topic. How do we think about a different role for for justice interventions that would be restorative? Uh, since I mentioned it, I'll go. Um, I'll also note that, that I, I just wanted to highlight the importance of, of, of the arts. Uh, we have an artist in residence and a poet in residence at Civil Rights for each year um, who are formerly incarcerated artists and poets um, who, um, through their work, um, are reaching people in different ways and are changing the way people think in ways that we can't do with legal arguments. Uh, I think that's absolutely vital. So um, that is a an area that most of the, the organizations in our field can be doing so much more in, um, collaborating with artists and musicians and, and storytellers and other media. Um, on restorative justice, um, I think it's absolutely vital. It's, it, I think it's often misunderstood. And there's a lot of uh, you know, prosecutors around the country that are, are, that are using kind of restorative language, but putting those processes into, into the, the carceral framework and being the gatekeepers. Um, and so there's a lot of, 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 like anything that's become popular, like the bail field that I do a lot of work in, um, once it becomes so popular and, and sort of mainstream, um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a lot of versions of it out there and not every version is created equal. Um, I, uh, for, for people who are interested, without, instead of me saying a lot about it, since it's, it's not an area where, where I'm really qualified to, to, to educate about it. Let me just point you to some of the incredible work, um, uh, in particular, Miriam Kaba, 
um, last name is K-A-B-A, um, has curated a, a space online called transformharm.org, which is a really amazing place to go as an introductory um, place for podcasts, articles, um, videos, um, where you can learn about abolition, about restorative justice, um, a transformative justice, which is Miriam Kaba's term for a similar set of concepts. And also the work of Sujatha Baliga, B-A-L-I-G-A, -A, one of the real pioneers uh, in that field. Um, and then a, a really wonderful recent book that was written called Common, um, um, uh, called Until We Reckon by Danielle Sered, S-E-R-E-D, uh, who runs an organization in Brooklyn called Common Justice. Um, and all, all three of those people are, are incredible practitioners in different ways um, of, of restorative and transformative justice principles. And I, I, I really just want to point you to their work. Great. Um, we have another comment. This, I think this might be a great one for you, Cassandra, talking about how, we, how do we begin the conversation around drug addiction earlier since so many cases are occurring with underage teens? So I think the issue around uh, drug addiction uh, is often conflated with drug use. And so oftentimes people see people who use drugs and the laws that we have created are not actually based on real drug patterns. So it's important for most people to know that most people who use drugs don't actually ever create um, addiction or dependency. Um, that it's between the percentage of 10 to 20% of people who struggle with drugs. And all our policy is geared towards that. And so I think there's a couple of things. You know, when Bianca talks about art, I think so much of our drug policy and our information about drugs is pushed through either politicians that are trying to be tough on crime or TV and movies. So much of the way that we see drugs is through the um, lens of mass media. And it's been um, super reductive, super stigmatizing, and never gives any never gives us much information and so i think there's the conversation about there's multiple conversations about why do people use drugs what do people need to what do people need to thrive if they continue to use drugs and you know what is the harm for people using drugs like not the harm for themselves but what is the harm to general society and so i think those are questions that are really struggle that some people really struggle with because it means that um, it, uh, it violates people's sensibilities about drugs. Um, and then we're having a conversation. And when you have a conversation about drugs within a conversation around the criminal punishment system, you're talking about people's individual choices about what they do with their bodies, right? And so we are, one of our guiding principles is bodily autonomy. And oftentimes what drug policies and the criminal punishment system is around creating laws that have to do with regulating what people are able to do for themselves outside of others. And I think when we're having a conversation about drug addiction, then, it's, then the conversation really is, if you stabilize people in other ways through housing, through employment, through familial support, you'll find that people's problematic use can stabilize. Most people don't recognize that a lot of people who struggle with addiction, they stop using not because of treatment. Treatment has an end to ten, eight to 10% success rate. Most people stop using drugs because something in their atmosphere has shifted, be it they moved away, be it they have a, a relationship that they feel worth fighting for, they get housed. And so a lot of the questions that we struggle with where we try to regulate through policy, if we actually recognize that sometimes drug addiction is a symptom of a larger issue, and we actually dealt with the surrounding infrastructure and realized that criminalization exacerbates addiction and doesn't actually deteriorate addiction, or uh, deter addiction, um, we would be in a different place. But to my question around how do we start the conversation around drug addiction earlier, and then talk about young people, I think we need to have a massive shift in the way that we talk about drugs in mass media. Um, and I think we need to give people information about drugs that's not, if you use marijuana, you will use heroin the next day. It's like, if you use, you know, I said, um, if you use this kind of drugs, you should use roughage because it's gonna back you up. 
Or if you're going to use this drug, don't use it at night because it's going to keep you super awake. Or if you use this drug, don't mix it with this drug because that will kill you. I think we need to give people science-based, reality-based um, information and give people motivation, motivating, um, have motivating conversations with people that say, listen, if you are young, of color, in the inner city, using drugs is going to exacerbate the circumstances that you're already navigating. And that's fine. And these are other things that can reduce the harms associated with it. And I find that the, a lot of the way that we talk about addiction right now um, is not based in that reality. It's based in fear and stigma. Um, and that's not motivating in any way. And it doesn't deter most people. There's one more question, which I know we're a little bit over, but we've, we've given permission to talk a little bit longer. A question which I think is really important for our audience, especially here at Duke. The question was, how can undergraduates um, get involved in organizations like yours, get involved in the broader movements and types of work, whether it's artistic advocacy, litigation, community building. What are your thoughts of like looking back to, to your own undergraduate experiences or the undergraduates that you have working with you? What, what, what are things that students can do today to, to, to make a difference? I'll start with, with one higher level theoretical point and then maybe something more practical. Uh, so at a, high, at a high level of generality, I think it's very important very early on in your life to fortify your mind against the sort of relentless uh, propaganda um, and cruelty of our society. Um, like Cassandra was just saying, we have been thoroughly propagandized about drugs and drug addiction, but we have also been thoroughly propagandized about the entire criminal punishment system more generally, um, about many aspects of inequality in our society. Um, the main places that people get their information, whether it's uh, movies or um, corporatized news like the New York Times and Washington Post, these are institutions that throughout their entire history have supported all of the worst atrocities that our nation has committed, um, that our nation has tolerated, and they've been cheerleaders for them. And why is that? I think it's because these are all um, instruments of a certain kind of propaganda, um, a propaganda that benefits the, the sort of elite people who control and make policy in our society. And so um, they, 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 they further a very particular um, worldview that doesn't come across as ideological because we're, we're, we're surrounded by it so much so that we can't even notice it anymore. And so the first advice I give to a lot of young students is um, you need to surround yourself with people um, that you're in relationship with, who push you, who are critical, who will challenge the way you think, who will inspire you. Um, surround yourself with, with others who push you and hold you accountable. Um, number two, um, consume the arts, as much of the arts as you can, music, poetry, theater, literature. The, the, this is the way you expand your mind to what's possible. And um, all of those, those arts have, have, you know, throughout the centuries been perhaps the, the chief and leading form of pushback against fascist and authoritarian groupthink. Um, and so it's very important, I think, to, 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 to engage in, in that as a political act. And then third, um, you need to curate the information that, that you're exposed to. The, your mind that you're building and cultivating is your most precious possession. And I know that sounds a little bit corny, but um, there are an array of corporate forces that are, that are designed to profit off of your mind, to profit off of your ignorance. And so uh, it's absolutely vital that you treat your mind as your greatest asset. And you have a very limited amount of time. So who are you going to read? What kinds of critical scholars are you, are you going to read Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Angela Davis? Or are you going to read, you know, uh, some like ludicrous New York Times opinion writer who's never going to say anything important to you? Um, so you got, you got to think about like, what are you exposing your mind to? Um, deep critical journalism about our world um, or sort of standard corporate trash? Um, and the same is true with literature and, 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 and other things. So expose your mind to things that, that um, force you to think critically about the structures of our world. And so there's really great stuff. And, um, on, on, on the history of racial injustice in this country. Um, there's really great stuff on, on the history of capitalism in this country, and I encourage you to explore all those things as well. And then the practical suggestion is, if you're interested in getting involved in the system, 
I think probably the best entry place job that, that constantly has room for undergrads is interning at a public defender's office. Um, there's a public defender's office in every jurisdiction. You can go uh, work on behalf of people who are accused of crimes, investigate what the police did to them, investigate what the system is trying to do to them, help them build mitigation cases, and you'll see how the system works in a really beautiful way. That was what I did in college. I would say work for my center and we do research and advocacy and policy on criminal justice. So there's a place where you can do that work here, here at Duke as an undergrad. But the most meaningful experience for me as an undergrad was, was working at the local public defender's office. Cassandra, Bianca, suggestions for our- un Yeah, I'll undergrad. just add, I mean, I think that what Alex is, was getting at um, was, you know, I mean, just the idea of like, doing political education and committing yourself to political education and understanding how critical that is right now and understanding that actually many of the things that we are talking about are actually not really new concepts. Um, that these are concepts that have been iterated by names that, you know, uh, Cassandra and Alec and I have like mentioned, the Ruth Wilson Gilmore and Angela Davis, but these are elders of the movement. Um, these are not folks, you know, for those who aren't familiar with those names, those are not folks who are like, you know, in our, uh, time and space. They are folks, you know, who have been talking about this since the 1960s um, and, and, you know, and, and these notions of abolition and defund police are like antiquated in many ways, um, but also now seeing the surface in some. And so really, um, you know, diving in and, and thinking about your own political education uh, and and what your spirit sort of, um, your mind and spirit needs sort of in this moment. Um, and then, you know, I'd also mention, I think, volunteering, interning, right, for different organizations. Cassandra, I think, you know, shared a really beautiful story. And she's ED now of an organization that she used to intern at um, as a graduate student. And so really um, uh, elevating that, I think also, um, hopefully everybody will go around is the same, but like follow our work, right? So um, go to our website, sign up for newsletters because, you know, we send out actual actions that you can do every week. Like everyone right now can get on the computer and go and sign the petition to remove Tom Gores from the LACMA board. Sign petitions are actually really effective. Um, right, you can follow us on Twitter, on social, on uh, Instagram and other social media for us, um, just at Worth Rises, um, but where again, we are sharing um, regular action items um, that we encourage you to participate in, but also to then share with your friends and, um, and do things like that. Like when we are having a campaign and we wanna uh, do a call-in day to legislators, it's always super helpful to have some volunteers or to have people who are uh, moving those things um, around and encouraging people to pick up the phone um, and call somebody. So um, I think all of those different things I would encourage um, you to do so that you can stay abreast of exactly what's happening. But there are daily opportunities to take action um, that are sent out by all of our organizations. Um, and, uh, and, you know, you can participate in that by simply following the work. Would you like to close things out for us, Cassandra? I think the one of the biggest things that I will say that I think may be a little unorthodox is I think people in undergrad, you have this opportunity to do your own work. And I think people should figure out what it means for you to figure out what kind of person you want to be in society. So much of the work that Alec, Bianca, and I do is built on relationships and being able to build meaningful relationships. Um, I think you have the opportunity to be an undergrad, um, to have a health system which pro may provide you the opportunity to do um, therapy. Um, because I think a lot of people, we are, op we are operating in the world of harm. And if you're not dealing with your own internal harm, um, that will be magnified in how you do the work and how you show up. Um, and I think it's really important for people to be um, able to figure out how they operate in the work, how they're complicit in the space, how they benefit from the structures that we're all trying to dismantle, um, and figure out what your relation is to the work. And so as people that are um, 
able to be in internships, do volunteer work, you know, do take all the seminars, that's all good. But if you're not doing your own internal work, it's going to show up in the work that we need. And this moment is super crucial. Um, and the things that we don't have time for are ego and misunderstanding and people that are blind to the ways that they are complicit and benefiting from the structures as they are. Um, and so as much as there is a lot of external work to do, there is also internal work to do. And I, I think oftentimes in our movement, people put forward the external work and never do the internal work until something blows up. Um, and so I think it's really important for for me to say that people need to forward their internal work. Undergrad is a moment where you're learning so much about so many different things. Um, and it is an incredible privilege to do that guided um, with someone. And um, I would say for people um, to take advantage of that opportunity and those resources, um, because we need whole people doing the work. Um, if we wanna build a whole society, we need whole people doing the work. Thank you, thank you. I thank you all. I really, really enjoyed this. I certainly benefited from it. And I hope you all who are watching this either in person live right now or later watching the recording. Thank you so much, Cassandra and Bianca and Alec for, for sharing some deep thoughts and some motivation with us. And hopefully those of you who watch this are also charged up and this event certainly lived up to the Stand for Justice name and theme from the Sanford School here at Duke. Thank you, Dean Kelly. Thank you, all the organizers. And uh, I look forward to the next events in this series. Please stay in touch with any of us on this panel if you'd like to learn more. I know the panelists circulated some links to their organizations and um, please do follow whatever trains of thought that this pushes you in. That was, that was our goal, to, to motivate your thinking and your spirits. So good night, everyone. Thanks again.